Okay. I'm hoping that everyone can see um, see the screen. Um, I don't know whether I can get like a, a thumbs up or anything if people can see things or can they see the screen that I've uh, that I've put up. I can see a screen, a white screen. Fantastic. Okay, that's great. <laughs> OK, uh, so so we'll make a start. Um, this is a, a bit of an introduction to understanding behaviours of concern. As you know, uh, this is being recorded, uh, so if you're happy to uh, keep your cameras and microphones turned off, there might be a little bit of time at the end for some questions, but we'll have to see how we go. There's quite a bit of information to get through. What I would say is that there's going to be no identifiable information in this presentation at all. And if you have any questions, uh, I probably would keep them to the, the theory and the ideas. Um, if you have any questions afterwards, I'm afraid I can't talk about anything specifically clinical um, just because of the nature of my work and that I wouldn't have any families allocated to my caseload. But if you are concerned about your child and you think a referral to our service is appropriate, the service that I work for, by the way, is BU, um, then uh, feel free to get in touch with your teacher, social worker, GP, paediatrician, and ask for a referral. Um, so good afternoon. Uh, welcome. Uh, my name is Steve Farmer. I work as a clinical psychologist. Uh, I've worked in BU for about nine months now, uh, and I've worked in the field of learning disabilities for about 15 years. Uh, my areas of interest are with learning disabilities and behaviours of concern and positive behaviour support or PBS, which you might touch on a little bit later as we go along. Just to let you know in advance, my dog might come in uh, at some point, but when he realises there's no food involved, he'll probably just leave. Um, so the purpose of the session this morning, once again, quite a lot to get through, so I'll, I'll go as quickly as I can. I'll try and go at a reasonable speed, I'll, I'll rephrase. So to understand behaviours of concern, I guess, from a clinical point of view, it's a general introduction to the topic. It's good if you're new to the area of, of behaviours of concern. I also hope if you've got some experience in this area, that there'll still be some things that will be useful for you moving forwards. Uh, all of this is underpinned with the idea and the understanding that all children are different. All children with learning disabilities are different. In my job, I don't have a one size fits all approach. This is really just a foundation introduction. Uh, so if I say anything that you think, well, it doesn't apply to my child, you're probably right. Um, we're just going to go through some of the ideas of theory. We're going to get some background about the subject uh, of challenging behaviour or behaviours of concern. Uh, we're going to get some ideas uh, going so you can start thinking about and understanding those behaviours yourself and potentially doing some things if you want to outside of, the, of this conversation uh, to have a look at behaviours of concern if you are experiencing and if your child is displaying any. Uh, and then a little bit about some further resources as well. Once again, all of this uh, is related to an approach called positive behaviour support or PBS. And I am going to leave a bunch of resources and links uh, at the end of the presentation. I'll also email this presentation uh, over to the school. So if you want to have a copy of this, uh, then you're absolutely welcome to. Um, OK, so we'll make a bit of a start. Uh, so this is a little bit about how other people have understood behaviours of concern uh, sort of over the years. And I do want to start talking a little bit about language. This is a, a bit boring, I'm afraid, but uh, bear with me because it, it's really important to me anyway. Um, so in a sort of the, before the 1930s, the idea of disturbed individuals or disturbed behaviour was very common uh, and was used as a medical description. Uh, after a while, this was decided to be completely inappropriate. And in around the 1930s, the idea of maladaptive behaviour became used. Uh, maladaptive behaviour still is not a, a great description, really, for people who behave in a way that's concerning for others. So in the 1990s, thereabout, the term challenging behaviour came about. Now, this, this label, this description, was used originally to describe behaviours that challenge services to make changes to their practice. So it was initially a really positive way of understanding. Um, over time, however, it's become a little bit more like a diagnostic label. So the term challenging behaviour would become synonymous with my child has challenging behaviour 
or they've got a diagnosis of challenging behaviour. What I would make clear is that challenging behaviour is, is not actually a diagnosis. So more recently, in the, later in the 2000s, the idea of behaviours of concern came about. It's the language that I use. It's the language that the British Institute of Learning Disabilities use. And it's really important that um, where we can, uh, we try and move with the times. In about 10 years from now, behaviours of concern will probably be seen as a really old fashioned way of describing things. But for the time being, if there are bits in this presentation that have challenging behaviour or other language in there, it's not what I use, I'm just quoting what other people have used before. OK. So what are behaviours of concern? And there's a, there's a few quotes. The, the biggest one is, is that it's culturally abnormal behaviour of such an intensity, frequency or duration that the physical safety of the person or others is likely to be placed in serious jeopardy. All behaviour which is likely to seriously limit use of or result in the person being denied access to ordinary community facilities. It's a bit of a mouthful, but really the thing to focus on is this idea of intensity, frequency and duration. And that the outcome of these behaviours of concern are restrictions placed on the individual, those around them, uh, and the access to normal everyday community facilities can be reduced. Another way of describing it is that challenging behaviour is normal, it occurs, it happens, and there's a good reason for that, and we'll go on to that in a moment. Um, but actually, it's not as strange, potentially, as we might first think. And then lastly, and anyone who is a parent will probably be able to relate to this one. It's behaviour that you off. Um, since it's being recorded, I'm not going to say it. Um, but I think that's a very normal way of understanding these behaviours. Actually, they can be upsetting for us and those around. So a few examples of behaviours of concern. Uh, there, there, there's loads. I mean, I, there's a list here, but it's entirely possible that I've missed. Uh, ones that you experience yourself at home or or maybe some that you yourself exhibit from time to time when you're feeling frustrated. Um, but the thing to bear in mind is that there is a big list. It's very long uh, and that it depends entirely on how we receive these behaviours, whether or not they're concerning or not. So, yeah, once again, it's a social definition. So behaviours of concern is something that we describe um, and we describe it based on where we are in time or place or who we're with or what our own threshold is, or our own tolerances for behaviours of concern. So for example, undressing. If we think about undressing, uh, if we're going to bed, it's uh, an acceptable behaviour. If we're on the bus, it is a behaviour of concern. Outing, that's more than acceptable at a football match, but less so in church. Another example would be aggression. Aggression is perfectly appropriate if you're a boxer and you're in a boxing ring, not so much if you're at a job interview. And lastly, just as an example, tantrums uh, for two-year-olds, very commonplace, not so much for a 22-year-old. So the thing to bear in mind here is that behaviours that are concerned are seen as such because of the conditions that we're in. Moving on to a, a nice little um, a vignette or an example used by Edwin Jones, when he talks about the maladaptive abnormal dysfunctional waiter. So I'm just going to read this out to you. You're in a restaurant, you try to attract the waiter's attention, they ignore you completely. Eventually, when they take your order, they're impatient, distracted, they hardly speak to you and don't smile. Then you have to wait a long time before they bring your food, which is cold and it's got the wrong side order. And the question is what you think about that waiter. Uh, there's a good chance that you'll think that he's a not a very good waiter. Um, that he's a bad person maybe, that he shouldn't be a waiter and he definitely shouldn't be getting a tip for any of the work he's done. However, this is the information that we have to hand. But what if you knew that the waiter had worked a very long shift the night before? What if he'd had very little sleep? What if he had toothache at the time or was told that there was a pay cut before his shift started and that he'd have to hand over all of his tips? Of the shift that he's on, only two of the four waiters have turned up and 20 people have arrived unexpectedly for a meal. My point here is that it's easy to make decisions about behaviours of concern when we don't know why those behaviours are happening. And as a psychologist, my role, I think, is to try and help people to understand why behaviours of concern happen. Um, and because when we do understand why behaviours of concern are happening, we look at the waiter a little differently. We may still be disappointed about the standard of our service, but 
we have a little bit of a glimpse as to why these things are happening. So moving on to what we call form and function of behavior. So it's two things we're looking at, form and function, two separate things to think about when you're thinking about behavior and behaviors of concern. So the form of behavior is what the behavior looks like. Uh, punching, kicking, slapping, talking, walking, moving, screaming. It's the description of the behavior. And the second thing is the function or what it does. So what does the behavior do? Does it get something? Does it get away from something? Does it get someone? And when we think about uh, the function of behavior, the British Institute of Learning Disabilities, or BUILD, and I'd always recommend having a look at BUILD's website for more information about behaviors of concern. They suggest five functions of behavior. First one is to reduce or find relief from pain or discomfort. Uh, toothache, stomachache, headache, um, just feeling rubbish, you know, those things, uh, you know, are ways of getting, behaviors of concern are a way of getting relief from those things, escape or, or, you know, help, getting help with those things. Attention or interaction. Um, I can't tell you the number of times that people have said, oh, it's just attention seeking and have described that as something that is um, not something to be concerned about. The truth is, is that a lot of the young people I work with, they have problems with their attention. Uh, and they also uh, seek out social relationships in different ways than we do, but for the same reason, uh, to have relationships, to have friendships. So that's another one of the functions of behavior. Uh, another one is to get away from demands. Uh, this is probably the one that I hear the most. Um, normally when someone's been asked to get ready for school or to start doing some work or to get changed for bed or to brush teeth or to go to the toilet, um, the list goes on really. And the behaviors of concern can function as a way of getting out of that demand. Um, tangible reasons is another very, very common one. Uh, and that is really to get something the young person wants. So it could either be an item, a toy, a sweet, some food, or it could be an activity, going out in the park, playing a game with somebody. But the, the function of that behavior is to then get that tangible. And the last one according to build is sensory. So if, if someone's feeling overwhelmed um, in an environment they're in, or if someone is feeling like they need to have more of something to feel settled, so more uh, movement, more visual stimulation, they may behave in ways that are concerning, um, and actually it's just to get that sensory need met. So the five uh, main functions of behaviour. So there's a question about what keeps these behaviours of concern going, you know, if, if they have functions, um, what keeps them going? So so we call this maintaining or maintenance, um, but effectively they're um, but they kept going by the outcome. So did the person get what they wanted? Um, did the person get the the suite? Did the person get the activity or or the toy? Um, did they avoid something they didn't want? Did they get out of going to the supermarket or the doctor's appointment or doing some study? Did they get the attention they needed, you know, as a result of the behaviours of concern? Did someone spend a lot of time with them? Whether that was positive or negative, sometimes that doesn't matter. Did they get a, sen a sensation they were trying to create? So did they start to settle themselves down with some kind of movement? Or for some young people I work with, when their behaviours of concern start, they might be taken out in the car to settle them. And that movement can actually be really, really uh, satisfying and rewarding. So that they're the questions, and if the answers to those things are yes, then we can say that those behaviours are being maintained. And if a behaviour is rewarding to a person, it's more likely to be repeated, and that's the same for everybody. Um, so that's that's worth bearing in mind about the main, maintaining of behaviour. If it's rewarding, it'll keep happening. So what leads on to a behaviour concern? What contributes to what? Um, so we talk about two things, really, internal factors, and external factors, and they lead to behaviours of concern. So I'll go on to talk about those in a minute, but it's the combination of those two. Sometimes it's more one than the other, but more often than not, there's two things going on that can lead to those behaviours of concern. Sometimes this can explain why behaviours come out of nowhere. Um, for example, you might be going on a usual visit to a usual place that you know that your child really enjoys, but there's behaviours of concern and you don't know why. It could be that for some reason there's something internal going on. 
that's, that's led to those behaviours of concern. Equally, they might have been fine all morning at home, really happy, really well, but then you've moved to somewhere new and the behaviours of concern have started. So it's the combination of those two internal and external factors. And just a few examples of internal and external factors. So things like being tired, uh, sudden or ongoing pain, boredom, low mood, uh, having a learning disability, so not being able to understand necessarily what's going on, having a diagnosis of autism. They're all examples of internal factors, and there's loads more, but they're just examples. And when it comes to external factors, we could be thinking about noise, a crowded environment, being too hot or cold, not enjoying a setting, it's not somewhere we want to go, like the doctors or um, you know some kind of appointment we're not looking forward to. Uh, it's not being an enjoyable setting at all. Poor relationships, um, so not having those social relationships we care about available and not having much to do. These are all things that are external factors. So I wanted to spend a little bit of time just talking through how behaviours of concern happen. Uh, what I'm going to show you is, is called the arousal cycle. Some of you may be familiar with it. Uh, it's called the anger assault cycle originally. I don't think that's a great title. We'll call it the arousal cycle for the time being. Um, so imagine that the graph you're looking at, uh, across the bottom is time. So from left to right goes time. And then the red line is the behaviours of concern. So what, for what we first notice is what we call baseline. So this is when the young person is that they're most settled, that they're most calm. Everything's just as it should be. Uh, and there's nothing going on particularly that's a problem. Uh, we then move on to what's called the trigger phase. So this is something that has happened that has set something off. So this could be the demand. It could be a sudden pain. It could be an overwhelming sensory experience. So then we have the trigger that um, and if the trigger is not uh, addressed or understood or, or noticed then we'll have escalation so in escalation we'll start to see behaviors of concern that are possibly lower level so they could be things like vocalizations or increased pacing or rocking backwards and forwards or refusal uh, and those are all behavioral signals that the young person is distressed and are beginning to get more distressed if those things are, are missed, and that's, sometimes it's very easy to do because this phase can be very quick, the young person might go into crisis phase. Now, crisis phase is when the young person is experiencing what we might call fight or flight response. You may have heard of that, but it's also now called fight, flight or freeze. Um, and this fight or flight response is when our brains are seeing threat and danger. They're anticipating danger. And what they are doing is they are flooding our system with stress hormones like cortisol and adrenaline to try and keep us safe. So at crisis, we'll have certain physiological responses like our pupils will dilate, our heart rate goes up, uh, blood is pumped to the most important areas of the body, like the, the muscles and the legs and the arms, so we can be prepared to fight off flight and also with the key organs, so the lungs, the heart, so they can pump faster and take in more oxygen. When we're in crisis phase, we're not really available for discussion. We're not available to be reasoned with and we're not available to, to bring ourselves back down. It normally lasts for about 20 minutes, although people have often disagreed with me. Um, but the research suggests that adrenaline and cortisol is about 20 minutes long. After that, we have this kind of um, uh, de-escalation phase or recovery phase. The reason why lots of parents say to me it doesn't last 20 minutes, you don't know what you're talking about, is because when we're in de-escalation, when we're recovery, there's lots of opportunities for us to go back into crisis. As you can see, that little pointy, those two pointy red marks. Um, what can happen is we can go back into crisis and we can start the cycle all over again. So if recovery phase is started, if you start to notice a reduction in those much more severe and extreme behaviours, the advice really is just sort of leave things as, he, as they are, keep things very, very safe. After that de-escalation phase, we might have what we call post-crisis or recovery or a depressive phase. At that point, we're feeling um, pretty rubbish. Uh, the young person that uh, your child, the young person I would be working with, 
will be feeling quite low and miserable, uh, maybe tearful, maybe want to spend time on their own, not very engaged. And, and that period of time can be variable as well. After that, we go back to baseline. So when we're back at baseline, that's when we are calm and relaxed. The thing to bear in mind is that between crisis and baseline, it can be about an hour and a half on average. So it's really important for me to talk about trigger, avoiding triggers and avoiding escalation when it comes to behaviours of concern. Can I have a glass of water, excuse me. So, so how this works is we go through all of these phases, we come back to baseline, uh, and then things to bear in mind, most importantly of all, is that it's only at baseline when we are really available for learning. So lots of times when young people are going through trigger, trigger phase or the escalation phase, um, those around them will reason or try to have teachable moments or try to explain what's going on in a way uh, that is about learning. Um, and it doesn't tend to work very well. In crisis, of course, there's no learning happening whatsoever. So uh, my advice is always, if we're doing anything teaching related, that the baseline is, is best. Um, which would be classed as a proactive strategy, which we'll mention briefly later on. Um, the other thing to bear in mind, uh, and not everyone knows this, but I think it's really important to bear in mind, is that actually we go through this process too. So I worked as a support worker for two and a half years before I started uh, working in the psychology field. And we called the post-incident sort of depressive phase, that one, uh, time for a fag break. And it's time we went outside and we would sort of console each other that it was a really difficult situation and we feel a bit bad about our job. But I would also say that that phase, in my experience as a clinician, is also what happens to parents when the situation is really, really frightening and difficult and distressing. We can go into that, into that phase ourselves and think, you know, am I doing very well as a parent? I feel very frustrated with myself. I'm quite tearful. So these things are all part of this cycle and very, very normal and expected uh, part of the cycle. So that makes sense, by the way. And if there are any questions, we can we can go back to this uh, all being well. So the key points are that's a whistle stop tour of behaviours of concern. But the key points, behaviours of concern or behaviours of challenge are not diagnostic labels. They're not a diagnosis. They're, a, they're, they're things that are uh, social. They depend on our circumstances, depends on the person, the setting, the decade, uh, whether or not those things are seen as challenging or not. Uh, behaviours of concern are the interaction between the individual and their environment. Uh, it's not often that it's just one or the other, but it does sometimes happen. Um, behaviours have form and function, and they continue for as long as they work, for as long as they are useful. And the best place for someone to learn is at baseline, when they're the most calm. And when it comes to crisis, we should always think safety and not worry about trying to negotiate or, or divert attention, for example. So that's the that's the, a lot of the, the theory stuff out of the way, um, but there's more, I'm afraid. Uh, how you can begin to understand behaviours of concern yourself. Um, and this is something that I will go through with families when I'm working with them uh, as part of the, the work that I do. The first thing is the functional assessment. It's really just a fancy way of saying this is the way to record and understand behaviours of concern. So a functional assessment is just recording and understanding those behaviours of concern. And what it can include is things like observation. So I will go and visit schools and observe a child when they're distressed, or I might observe a child in the home environment. It includes interviews, so speaking to parents, because those parents, they know their child the best. Uh, and I might speak with teachers, I might speak with uh, social support if someone uses a short break service. Uh, and lastly, behaviour recording. And the method that we're going to talk about today very briefly is called the ABC chart. Um, and it's just one method. There are a few others, but this one is the one that tends to get used the most. And I think probably would be the most applicable to most families I work with. Something to bear in mind. So people do not engage in self-injury or aggression because they have developmental disabilities. There is logic to the behaviour and the functional assessment is an attempt to understand that logic. Now, something I would just like to mention very briefly is what we call clinical overshadowing. 
Um, if you haven't heard of it before, what clinical overshadowing is, is explaining behaviours of concern by saying the person has a learning disability. Oh, that's their learning disability, that's why they're doing that. Or, oh, that's because they're autistic, that's why they're doing that. Now, this is not the case, and it's also really unhelpful because it can leave families thinking that this is something that we just have to deal with. In my experience, the children that I've worked with have never intentionally or wanted to feel the way they feel when they are injuring others or injuring themselves. Um, they don't want to do that. What they want is the same as what we all want, to feel safe, uh, to have friendships, to be a part of a community, um, to have things that they care about around them, to have fun. Um, and so what we what I tend to find is that sometimes people are using this approach, this clinical overshadowing to describe and explain those behaviours, but it's not the case. So there is a logic to this behaviour. The functional assessment is a way of trying to understand it. And as I've mentioned, observation, interview and behaviour recording are three ways that we can do what we call a functional assessment. OK, so why might you want to record behaviours of concern? I mean, it's not going to be a huge amount of fun if, if you're thinking about doing it, um, but there are reasons. Firstly, it's to look at patterns in behaviours of concern. So I would always recommend when I work with the family, if they're in a place where they can do this, I'd recommend they start recording behaviours of concern using an ABC chart. Once again, we'll, we'll go to that in a minute. Uh, and over time, you might start to notice that, oh, this happens every time this person is around or this happens uh, nine o'clock every Tuesday morning, or this happens straight after a bath for some reason. So what might be useful about recording behaviours of concern is that we can start seeing reasons why uh, the patterns behind the behaviours of concern. The other reason is, is to find out why they happen and why they keep happening. So we mentioned about maintaining the behaviour. So there's some value to why they keep happening but also finding out why they happen in the first place is a really important key to avoid them happening in the future. To be prepared for if you work with a clinician. So it might be that an approach is used very much like mine uh, based on positive behaviour support. Uh, and we would ask people to record when we start meeting with them. If you've already started, uh, it's a massive help to us. And all of that knowledge that you have as a parent is already going into that piece of work. Uh, please don't underestimate how important it is for us as clinicians to work uh, collaboratively with parents. We, you know, I don't work from a model that says I know better than you, I don't. Uh, when it comes to your child, there's no one that knows more than you guys do about your child. Um, and so actually when you, when you start to record all of that knowledge that you have, you're starting to share that with us and that's hugely helpful. So that's another reason why you might want to record. And also it can help inform the intervention. So any work that we decide to do, if you if you work with the clinician, uh, it helps to inform that. It helps to evaluate whether it's worked or not. Um, and it's really, really, it's really helpful for us. So moving on to the ABC chart. The ABC chart is made up of three things, surprisingly. A, B and C. Um, and the A stands for antecedents. Uh, that just means the things that are going on before the behaviour happens. It's mist mistakenly understood as the trigger, but it's not the trigger. So the antecedents are just the things that are happening before. Now that before can be from a long time before, or it could be immediately, what we call slow or fast triggers. So something that's happening for a long time might be that the person has been off because of coronavirus and has had very little to do. That would be a slow trigger. That's something that's contributing to someone's difficulty. A fast trigger would be being asked to do something they don't want to do or not being able to have access to something they do want. So the antecedents are external and internal and they're things that could have happened a long time ago or things that could happen recently. But what they are not is triggers. We're not trying to explain triggers here. So that's the antecedents. The behaviours, very simply, what actually happens in the moment. If you're looking to do your own ABC recording, what I'd always recommend is that you describe the behaviours as if you're observing them from a distance almost. 
uh, very objectively, very impersonally. So you describe the behaviours with what we call performance language. So kicking, punching, bit, biting, spitting, things like that. You wouldn't use phrases like kicked off because actually they, they're not that helpful for you guys and they're not helpful in when it comes to understanding what might be going on. Uh, I'll go to a few examples in a moment, but that's kind of uh, how behaviours work. They're just the things that actually happens and are observable. The consequences are what happens afterwards. This could be any number of things, and some of those things might be invisible to us. But for as far as possible, it's worth writing down what happens next. It's not punishment or reward. Uh, the word consequences become associated with punishment or reward. But actually, it just means the thing that happens after the behaviour. So it could be, for example, um, people left the room. It could be that um, somebody uh, took their stuff out of the room, somebody left the space, somebody um, said something to the person, somebody started talking to another person. It might not necessarily be a consequence that seems directly to impact on the young person. Um, it, it could be, but it doesn't necessarily mean that it is. So just to go through that again, antecedents, the stuff that happens before, Behaviour, the behaviour itself, consequences, the things that happen afterwards. I'm just going to now go on to a few examples of ABC charts just to give you a bit of a think about what might be going on in an ABC chart. Uh, and this is the sort of thing that we look at. Now, once again, all of this is anonymized and, and it's these are these are scenarios I've made up. So they aren't they aren't people that um, you would know or have met or they're just they're just made of characters. So Tom 14. Um, if we think about the antecedent here, what's been written down? For me as a clinician, if it's Monday 8 a.m., uh, Tom's had a bad night's sleep. It's his first day back at school, he's on his iPad. His brother's staying off school for some reason, and uh, he was asked to get dressed by his mum or dad. The behaviour, as Tom shook his head, he started to shout. He grabbed my arm and dug his nail in with both hands, and he bit his bottom lip. And the consequences are that I screamed, the parents screamed, told him to stop, said he could stay at home with me, and Tom stopped and went back to his iPad. Just have a moment to look at that and, and have a think about what might be causing those behaviours to happen and what might be maintaining or keeping those behaviours going for future events. Let's have a quick look at that. As you can imagine, normally, in this situation, how we give five minutes or so to have a think, talk with your partner, and we'd have some kind of interactive discussion about it. Um, it's not quite possible at the moment. Uh, so what I would say is you might think that what caused the behaviour is that he might be tired. Um, he might be nervous about his first day back. Um, he might have been enjoying spending time with his iPad and was upset about it being taken away. Um, or he might be confused because he's going to school, but his brother isn't. So they're all possible reasons for the behaviours of concern. And then when it comes to what might be keeping the behaviour going, uh, well, it's possible that saying he could stay home uh, is the reason and it keeps the behaviour going. Or it could be that he went straight back to his iPad uh, and slowly over time he realizes that if I behave in a particular way either I can avoid something I don't want to do or I can get something back that I want to have like the iPad. So I hope you can see that the ABC chart, the unseen behaviors and consequences, they don't make these guesses. It's my job as a clinician to make those guesses with parents after we've got quite a few of these written down. This is just an example of, of sort of how it works. The, the next example is of an ABC chart is for, for Sarah. Sarah's 11 years old. It's Saturday, it's 12 p.m. They're in the supermarket. It's very busy, it's very bright. There's lots of noise and Sarah's in a buggy and she's wriggling quite a lot. The behaviours, uh, Sarah starts to squeal. She's reaching out to try and grab the tins from the shelves as they're going around the supermarket. And she's slapping herself using an open palm to the head. Consequences are that mum or dad promised her a treat, which didn't seem to work. Um, the items that she was grabbing were taken away from her. They left the shop. Sarah calmed down. So have a quick moment to have a think about that one as well.
Had enough time to have a look? I'm going to guess you have, because I'm talking in my own dining room to myself. So, um, what might be causing the behaviours to happen? Could be the supermarket. Could be that it's busy and bright and noisy. Um, it could be that Sarah is in a buggy and she doesn't like it. Um, or it could be the time of day. There could be any number of reasons why this is happening. And over time of lots and lots of recording around the supermarket or near the supermarket or at the same sort of time of day, we'll start to notice patterns, hopefully, that would suggest what the actual trigger or the cause of the behaviour might be. The things that might be maintaining or keeping the behaviour going could be leaving the shop. So if it is about the supermarket and leaving the shop leads to her calming down over a period of time, she might start to notice that if I behave in a particular way, I get to leave an environment that I'm not comfortable in. So this is what we call the maintaining behaviour. Hopefully that makes sense as well. The last one is about Mark. He's eight years old and it's Thursday 4pm. School is on school holidays. Everything's calm. Mark's playing with his phone. The behaviours of concern. Mark grabbed my hair. He's bringing his knees to his chest. He's crying, red in the face, couldn't calm down. The consequence. I said nothing but moved away. Gave him some space for 10 minutes. Offered him some food. And this lasted for about one hour. And just have a look at this one. This is a little bit of a curveball one to have a look at. But have a look, see what you think. I'm sorry if my chair is very creaky as well. I don't know if you can hear me. So this is one of those tricky ones where actually it's not clear. It's not clear what the antecedents lead to. It's not clear what the trigger might be. It's not clear what may keep this behaviour going, if indeed there is something that keeps it going. Because there doesn't seem to be anything that makes a lot of sense. Situations like this, it can be useful to look directly at the behaviour. And if we look at the behaviour, we could suggest there are things in common with that behaviour that could point to one of those five functions we talked about earlier. Uh, and it's possible, but not certain, that this is to do with pain. And there's a lot of research done out there about young people with disabilities experiencing pain and how that can lead to high levels of behaviours of concern. But these things are misunderstood and overlooked. And it's that thing we call clinical overshadowing. It's been understood that it's just part of the learning disability, not actually that the person's got indigestion or constipation uh, or that someone has a tummy ache. Um, it could be any of those reasons. But the thing is to bear in mind is that the ABC chart is useful in lots of different ways but it's most useful when it keeps getting filled out. So as a clinician, I'll ask people to fill it out and they'll say, we've done this before. We filled it out a few times, but it didn't seem to help. Um, the advice really is to keep filling out as, as long as you can. And even when we've started doing some kind of intervention, uh, I, I would, I'll continue to ask a family to record for me. So there's three ABC charts, three examples of what might uh, be going on in a setting and three different ways of looking at behaviours of concern, and I hope those are a little useful as well. So the question I guess then comes is, is what do we do next? What do we do with this information, this behaviours of concern? We've got, we've got a list of behaviours of concern. We've got a list of the antecedents, what was happening before. We've got a list of behaviours and we've got a list of consequences. What do we do with that? Particularly if you're not working with a clinician, what might you want to do yourself? Well, you might want to try and make sense of these behaviours. And you can look at patterns. Uh, so those patterns could be, like I said before, happening on the same day of the week, happening with a certain person, happening uh, after a certain event or before an event, happening when something isn't available or is available. Uh, and sometimes it can be really clear and make good sense. And sometimes it can be a little bit less clear. But an, an option then is to actually have a chance to look at those ABC charts with family members, uh, with teachers, for example. Uh, and see if the same is happening in other places. See if you can make sense of where these things are happening uh, and whether or not there's similarities across different settings. Um, you may find that teachers in, in school will already be recording behaviours of concern in this kind of way. Think about what maintains the behaviour. So if you've got a pattern that happens over and over and over and over again and, and over and over and over again, the situation is very similar and, and we respond in the same way as parents, then that might suggest what might be maintaining the behaviour. It could be that we offer the treat 
or it could be that we take the person away from a difficult environment, or it could be that we give them sensory feedback that we they need, or it could be that we give them time and support and they're looking for that. None of these things are criticisms, by the way. Um, those consequences uh, are not, um, they're not a value judgment. As parents, it's really difficult to know what to do in, in given situations. Uh, and my job is not to say whether something is right or wrong. My job is just to say, well, it's possible that this thing might be leading to the behaviour being maintained. The other thing you can do is, is think about quality of life. Um, quality of life is something that I'll mention briefly later, uh, although we don't have many slides left, so not, not long from now. Um, but thinking about quality of life is really, really important. Quality of life for me is the most important thing we can think about. And that quality of life stretches out to not only the child, but everyone around the child. Um, so it's it's one of the things that I, I focus on a great deal in my work. Uh, and then lastly, thinking about proactive and reactive strategy. And I'll mention those a little bit in a minute. Just to bear in mind that there's a document called Challenging Behaviour, a Unified Approach. It's very dry and it's very boring. But in that document, they talk about a two pronged approach to managing or dealing with behaviours of concern. The first is proactive. So thinking about things you can do before the behaviour happens. And then reactive things about things you can do when the behavior has started to happen, when the person is escalating or when they've reached crisis. Uh, so we'll mention those very briefly as well in a moment. So these are some of the challenges for people with a learning disability. And because I'm, I'm on presenting mode, it's come out really small, um, but I'm hoping you can see them. But uh, things like not having access to ordinary everyday activities, uh, for one reason or another, um, having a negative reputation because those behaviours keep happening and they're very difficult for people to be around, mental health difficulties, poorer health outcomes, uh, poorer access to normal everyday community facilities, um, less activity, social networks being small and dense. And what we mean by that is that not only are there fewer people in that person's life, but it's possible that those people all know each other. Um, now, if you think about your friendship groups, potentially, you'll know people who won't have ever known anybody else in your friendship network. So um, it's very different for people with learning disabilities. Quite often those people, they, they all know one another already. So that's quite a dense social network. And what we want is for someone to have a very broad social network. All of those things, they add together. And when they're added together, they equal a poorer quality of life. Um, and that's something that I try my best to to work on if I can with families or or even with systems around the family. Um, very briefly, and this isn't a particularly uh, scientific model, but it's what I found over the last uh, years that I've been working as a clinician. Is as we increase quality of life, so as we look at building skills, as we look at building opportunity, as we look at helping with communication, understanding what's going on, as we look at improving physical health, something happens all by itself. Behaviors of concern go down. Uh, if there's nothing else that, uh, that I've said that goes that you remember today, I hope it'd be this, that actually um, sometimes we don't need to think about techniques for removing or reducing these behaviors. These behaviours are meaningful and they're a communication of need oftentimes. Um, we don't really want to get rid of them because they might be the most reliable way of communicating the young person has. What we want to do is make those behaviours of concern unnecessary. And the way we do that is by increasing quality of life. And that's something that I can always talk about another time, um, but, but I don't think we'd have time to do that today. Um, so a little bit about proactive and reactive strategies. So proactive strategy is often very much focused on a quality of life improvement. Um, and the reactive ones are what we do when things have already started to go wrong. So those behaviours of concern have already started. Now, none of these things are recommendations because I work with families and very often the first thing they'll say to me is, we've tried it, it doesn't work. So this is not a recommendation, these are just examples. So some proactive strategies, skills building, working on a larger social network, uh, having access to normal everyday places, good health care um, and good self care for those people that support the young person. Parenting a child with a learning disability 
um, as a clinician, in my experience, is far more difficult and far more challenging and complicated than it would be supporting a child without a learning disability. And as such, it's really important that as parents you have support and you have time if it's available and you have services available to you that can offer that time that you need to recharge your batteries. Um, there's lots of different ways we can talk about self-care, um, but I would say that the most important is to make sure you have time. Uh, it's not always easily done. And like I said, these are not things I'm advising you to do. If they're not possible, they're not possible. But these are just some sort of general suggestions. When it comes to reactive strategies, we look at removing the triggers if possible. So if it's if it's reasonable, if we know that every time uh, we say no, the behaviours of concern go through the roof, we might try to use a different word than no. Uh, we're not, I'm not suggesting you give the young person everything they want, not at all. But what I'm saying is if the word is a, is a trigger, then different words might be possible. Like instead of the word no, the word now could be used. Now we're going to do this. Um, and these things can be tried. They don't always work, but they're options. A low arousal approach is, is something that I advocate for. It's based on the work of a guy called Andy McDonnell. Um, he's got a website called Studio 3, and there's loads of free resources on there. So the, the website, I think it's called studio3.org, I think. Um, loads of resources on there, loads of things to look at. That low arousal approach is about what do we do, those people that surround the behaviours of concern, how do we manage ourselves in the situation? It's less about what do we do to manage the child and how do we manage ourselves. Um, so it's, an it's got an interesting advice in there, interesting thoughts about what we can do. Uh, the other thing is about making sure the environment's safe. So if there's young people around that, that tend to get um, struck either by accident or on purpose, can they be out of the environment? If there's lots of bits and things available in the environment that could be dangerous, um, can we do? Can we remove those things? Or equally, uh, if the environment itself is a problem, can we help remove the person from the environment safely uh, and take them somewhere where they, they can have a breather? Um, and then there's things like distractions and diversions as well. Um, pointing out things that might be exciting, offering things to do that would be enjoyable for the young person. Just a little bit about proactive and reactive strategies. So lastly, just a few online resources. There's loads out there and they're all free. Um, it's worth bearing that in mind. So all of the stuff I talked about is based on positive behaviour support or PBS. I'm a practitioner and coach of PBS, um, so I'm a big advocate for it. Uh, I can talk about PBS at another time, but today was really just about understanding a little bit about behaviours of concern. Um, so there's a YouTube video. It's about six minutes long. Uh, it, uh, it talks about uh, PBS. And it's really, really useful. Um, there, it's got those anima animation things on there that are, are really easy and, and helpful to look at. And I find it the, the go to resource that I recommend to people. Um, there's a free PBS course um to look at which talks about all the things we've talked about today um and, and that like i say it's free you just click on it it's about two hours long uh, you can pick it up and drop it when you want to um but I, I think that's a really useful introduction uh there's information about further training so if you are interested in positive behaviors or if you are really interested in it you can look at things like foundation training or practitioner training uh you know moving forward and, and that information is on bill bill's website um the dimension model of challenging behavior is is great. It's 17 minutes long, the video. Uh, the guy that does the presentation is a bit like a mad professor, but he's fantastic. Uh, and he talks through why it is that behaviours of concern seem to come from nowhere, even though they're using the term challenging behaviour. Um, and he talks about things that are internal and external, things we talked about, but there's a really useful way of understanding that, that we didn't have time to talk about today. But that might be something you might want to have a look at. Uh, one of my favourite um, uh, practitioners when it comes to learning disabilities and behaviours of concern, what he calls it difficult behaviour, um, is Dave Petoniak. His website, Deimagine, has got loads of free printable resources on it. The one that's got the link on there is the one that I would recommend. It's got such great stuff in there that you can read and use and I think applies across the board. So that's a good uh, resource. There's an information sheet about PBS uh, from the PBS Academy. It tells you it's like a whistle stop tour of PBS. If you wanted to share the information with friends or family to let them know what it was you, you're interested in or doing, that's a really good resource. Uh, and the Challenging Behaviour Foundation, I think, is um, 
is another website that has so much free information. The other thing to bear in mind is that the Build website and the Challenging Behaviour Foundation both, I think, have support access so you can get in touch with them directly about things to do with positive behaviour support or behaviours of concern. So they might be options for thinking about getting more information. So there's a few online resources for you. There's a load of books out there um, that I, I might recommend. Some They do vary though, some of them are quite dense and, and quite complicated and not very accessible. Uh, then there's other ones uh, which I will show you in a moment when I, when I finish the presentation that's quite useful and has got some, some good ideas in it, but I might not necessarily use all of them. But what I would say about any resource is, you know, what you find useful, use. And if there's things that you don't find useful, um, then, uh, you know, leave those behind. Um, so, so that's about 50 minutes, I think just over 50 minutes. Um, and I'm, I'm happy if there's any questions at all, if I can help. Uh, and so, yeah, thank you anyway, for those of you who are here. But if there are any questions, then I'm going to be here for the remainder of the hour. OK. Oh, and lastly, um, this is the, this is the book. Oh, hang on, it's blurry. The book I was talking about is called What's the Message? And that's by uh, Helen Stewart and Simon Carnell, C-A-R-N-A-L-L. -L, and that's a really nice accessible resource. So are there any questions? At all from today. Hello. <laughs> I, thought, I thought you might just be relieved to actually see a face and hear a voice because it's quite difficult, isn't it, doing the presentation with no one? It's very odd. Yeah. yeah, it's just to say we're both here actually. So we just want to say in. we just want to say thank you for all your help. But I, I really, really um enjoyed listening to the talk and there's so many things that you've given us as a family that we're still using so it's very, yeah kind of you to say I, I haven't paid you to come on or talk just to make that perfectly clear to anyone else who's watching um no, thank you so much um it, i'm really pleased that it's been useful it's actually uh, really great to refresh those things again so thank you no problem and, and like i said i think at the beginning it's been recorded so it's accessible at a, at a later time if um uh, if anyone wants to have a look at it and down, I think download them for themselves. Uh, thank you very much, Ella. Thank um, you. You're welcome. Uh, any questions apart from that, or do we finish six minutes early? Okie dokie. Well, I'll take that as um, we'll finish a little early. Um, Thank you for your time. I appreciate you coming in and listening to me talk. Um, if there are any questions, um, I hope a lot of those questions will be answered through the resources. But if you have concerns about your child, if you're concerned about behaviours and they're of such a, a frequency, intensity or duration that makes you worried about risk or safety, then you might want to speak to your GP, your paediatrician, uh, or school or a social worker and ask for a referral to BU RLD service uh, and they'll be able to help you from there. Okay, thanks ever so much again for your time uh, and I hope you enjoy the rest of the week. Bye-bye. Thank you. Bye-bye. Thank you.